optimistic uh, that whether you're going to be actually uh, seeing. But in general, if you have any questions, uh, make sure that you add uh, some of your uh, questions on uh, the Facebook, and I will uh, try to answer those questions as uh, they become uh, available um, later on. So. Uh, this presentation is specifically uh, to deal with the uh, the development uh, again is Palestine statehood and the International Criminal Court jurisdiction. Uh, first, just to give us a brief background on uh, the International uh, Criminal Court, because not everyone is uh, familiar with this institution. Uh, the International Criminal Court is an intergovernmental organization and an international tribunal. Uh, intergovernmental meaning that it is a, an institution that is formed by uh, states um, that uh, commit themselves to uh, what is called the Rome Treaty uh, or the Rome Statute that brought the court uh, into uh, existence. Uh, the court is located in The Hague, the Netherlands, um, and the uh, court itself prosecutes uh, individuals for the international crimes of genocide, uh, crimes against humanity, uh, war crimes, and crime of aggression. Now, the case uh, for uh, Palestine right now uh, is looking specifically at uh, war crimes that have been uh, committed uh, as a result of uh, Israel attack on Gaza uh, in uh, 19 uh, in 2014 uh, now i do argue and do maintain uh, that israel should be charged for the crime of genocide uh, from the 1948 all the way up uh, to the present uh, but that's a different conversation for us to have now, if we look at uh, the world map, uh, the parties that are signatories of the uh, Rome statue uh, are in green colors. Uh, there are signatories that has not yet ratified. So there's a number of countries that signed uh, the Rome statue but have not yet ra ratified it uh, in their own uh, uh, processes uh, relative to their governments and their institutions. Uh, there are states that uh, subsequently withdrew its membership, uh, meaning that they uh, uh, entered into the membership of the International Criminal Court, but withdrew from it. And then signatories that subsequently withdrew its signature. And uh, key, key state in here <coughs> is the United States and Russia. Uh, both have uh, signed the, the Rome uh, a statute and then uh, they subsequently withdrew it. Uh, so again, this is as a result of the process. And again, the United States has been uh, subject to a number of uh, war crimes as uh, in relations to its war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the United States withdrew its signatures and actually has been on a constant uh, attempt to delegitimize uh, the International Criminal Court, uh, which also is the case with Israel. Then we have non-state uh, party, non-signatories, uh, which includes, uh, for our case, uh, is Israel is a state uh, that is not, uh, is a non-state party uh, to the uh, Rome Statue and uh, also to the International Criminal Court. Uh, but yet this did not leave them from wanting to actually uh, intervene in the court's proceedings uh, in relations to uh, issues pertaining to the Palestinians. <clears throat> now it became functional on uh, the 1st of July 2002. Uh, the Rome Statute is foundational governing do document, meaning it's the document that governed the uh, International Criminal Court. As of 2019, uh, November, uh, there are approximately 120, no, not approximately, but there's 123 uh, member states into the ICC. Uh, 42 states are non-party, non-signatory states. Uh, Palestine became par a party to Rome Treaty in 2015. Uh, so again, 
this is a very important step uh, because this is an intergovernmental uh, uh, court system, international court system, meaning that states are uh, to be included as members. Uh, so there was there's a, a, a process that the Palestinians have been moving forward uh, in pursuit of statehood. Uh, the uh, United Nation uh, uh, gave a nod, United Nations General Assembly gave a nod to the Palestinian statehood, which allowed the Palestinians uh, to uh, uh, become members of a vast in, uh, part of the United Nations uh, infrastructure and the International Criminal Court ad admitting uh, Palestine and accepting their signature on the uh, Rome Treaty uh, is an important step. And now we have a next uh, step in that process. Uh, Israel is a non-party and non-signatory state. The US and Russia withdrew their signature as well. So there's just a background. Now the ICC structure uh, that we need to be aware of, uh, the ICC has four divisions. Uh, it has the presidency, uh, the Judicial Divi Division, the Office of the Prosecutor, and the Registry. Now, the Office of the Prosecutor uh, is, uh, currently, uh, uh, is currently led uh, by Fatou Ben Sauda, uh, uh, who is from Gambia, uh, who has been on this, uh, in her uh, current position since 2012. Uh, she has the authority to investigate crimes and initiate initiates criminal proceedings before the judicial division. So that's where we are in relations to uh, the process and uh, her uh, decision to pursue the investigation of war crimes uh, in the, uh, uh, as a result of the 2014 uh, Israel attack is a very significant uh, step. Uh, on May 1st, uh, 2020, the Office of the Prosecutor issued her final determination on the question of Palestine statehood uh, in a 60-page uh, report. And this is a very important document because it actually moves into uh, the uh, three panel judges for consideration. Now, in uh, uh, Palestine at the International uh, Criminal Court, uh, jurisdiction and general status, uh, I said that on January 1st, 2015, the government of Palestine uh, lodged a declaration under Article 12, Section 3 of the Rome Statute, accepting the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, the ICC, over alleged crimes committed in the occupied Palestinian territories, including East Jerusalem, uh, since June 13, 2014. So again, this is the Israeli assault on Gaza and also other elements relative to the occupied territories. On January 2nd, 2015, the government of Palestine acceded to the Rome Statute by depositing its instrument of ascension with the UN Secretary General. Uh, so the Rome Statute entered into force on 1st of April, 2015, in relations to the government of Palestine. Again, as we get into some parts of uh, the prosecutor report, uh, we see, could see that uh, those who are uh, speaking or attempting to contest uh, the uh, ICC uh, jurisdiction raise some points uh, that are not, uh, uh, are not uh, unknown to uh, those who have been working with the Palestine issue altogether. Now, ICC uh, next uh, steps uh, is uh, according to the uh, to 16th of January 2015, the prosecutors announced then the opening of a preliminary examination into the situation in Palestine in order to establish whether the Rome Statute criteria for opening an investigation are met. Now, specifically under Article 53.1 of the Rome Statute, the prosecutor shall consider issues of jurisdiction, admissibility, and the interest of justice in making the determination. So again, the prosecutor, uh, uh, Ben Sauda, who, uh, who had the responsibility as the prosecutor, uh, has to determine uh, the issue of jurisdiction. Is the uh, current uh, occupied territories, uh, in here we're speaking about Gaza, the West Bank, uh, and East Jerusalem, uh, 
uh, we set aside the issue of uh, uh, all of historical Palestine. That's a different, different, and another conversation uh, that uh, is very important and critical. But in relations to the ICC, is to determine uh, whether there is a jurisdiction, uh, meaning is that an area? Is this an area that the International Criminal Court uh, has? Uh, the uh, legal authority to investigate, uh, or it is not, which is again, is part of uh, this dynamic that uh, the report that we're speaking about uh, is in engaging. Now, uh, as a result of the uh, uh, process that has been uh, put in the court to determine the jurisdiction, uh, the question arose uh, whether Palestine uh, is a state, and uh, the statehood of uh, Palestine and how uh, the uh, International Criminal Court need to approach this question. Uh, as a result, uh, the court, uh, the prosecutor asked for, uh, and the court asked for uh, individuals to submit amicus brief. And amicus briefs are a friend of the court brief, meaning that the court uh, solicits uh, the opinions and the feedback of individuals uh, to uh, give uh, some uh, context to uh, the uh, court's ability to determine this question. And this is a normal aspect of uh, court proceedings. Uh, we see it here in the US as well as in other places. So as a result, about 50 amicus briefs were submitted uh, to uh, the court. Uh, including one that I submitted as well, uh, and a whole host of others. So this is a list of uh, the various uh, individuals uh, and also institutions, uh, government institutions uh, that have submitted. Of note for us uh, Palestinians, uh, that we have a number of states that have submitted uh, a, a amicus brief in opposition to Palestine statehood. Uh, unsurpri uh, surprising again uh, of this of these states. Uh, so you have the Commonwealth of Australia. I mean, Australia submitted an amicus brief uh, opposing uh, the determination. Uh, Republic of Austria, uh, likewise. Uh, uh, the uh, Federative Republic of Brazil. So Brazil, which have historically been uh, very uh, strong in its uh, commitment to Palestinians and Palestine, uh, is actually uh, being right now governed by an extreme right-wing uh, uh, political uh, party and a president is actually uh, also expressed in a position opposing the Czech Republic as well. Uh, uh, issuing a similar type of position. Uh, Germany, the Federal Republic of Germany, ironically, uh, also uh, a, uh, submitting an amicus brief opposing uh, Palestinian statehood. And uh, Hungary uh, as well, uh, uh, similarly governed by a nationalist, uh, a extreme right wing. Nationalist, again, also you could say white nationalist, but tipping on a party that has origins in neo-Nazi uh, ba uh, uh, background. And then the Republic of Uganda from Africa. Uh, these are countries that have uh, submitted uh, amicus brief opposing uh, the Palestinian uh, determination of statehood as well as the jurisdiction uh, of the court. Uh, on the other side, the League of Arab States, representing the uh, Arab uh, states, submitted a, 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 an annex brief in support. And then the OIC, Organization of Islamic Cooperation, as well, including, and then the State of Palestine, uh, likewise uh, submitted uh, a brief as well. Now, the 60-page uh, ICC prosecutor's report, uh, I encourage people to download it and read it. Uh, if you are interested and want to keep up with uh, Palestine and all the issues uh, pertaining to Palestine at the international juncture, it's available at the ICC uh, uh, website. Um, you go to the prosecutor's office and you will be able to download it. 
<clears throat> the content of the report, uh, the key uh, uh, part or the key statements in here, uh, it says that the prosecutor is satisfied uh, that there is reason a reasonable basis to initiate an investigation into the situation in Palestine under Article 53.1 uh, of the Rome Statute, and that the scope of the court's territorial jurisdiction comprises the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and Gaza, which is the occupied territories. The prosecutor never, never, nonetheless uh, uh, requested the pretrial chamber to confirm the scope of the court's territorial jurisdiction in Palestine under Article 19.3. The, prosecu the prosecution has carefully considered the observations of the participants and remains of the view that the court has jurisdiction over the occupied Palestinian territory. So again, the prosecutor's position is to be very clear uh, that the court uh, has jurisdiction over the occupied Palestinian territories and as such it has the right uh, and the obligation to investigate uh, war crimes uh, that have been uh, committed. So that is the uh, essence and the, uh, the basis of taking the uh, next step to uh, turn the matters to the, the three uh, judge panel uh, to issue their ruling on the question. Uh, key items, of, uh, again, in there, uh, there is no basis to require the prosecutor to defer her request for a ruling on jurisdiction, jurisdiction until she has made any uh, application under Article 58 and the chamber should uh, promptly rule on the merits. So again, a number of uh, 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 briefs that were submitted were calling on the prosecutor to defer her request uh, on the jurisdiction and uh, get first a determination uh, on uh, by the court before the, actually uh, that proceeds. And uh, the prosecutors actually disagreed with this uh, point and asserted that, uh, uh, that the uh, court should move ahead uh, with uh, the determination. Uh, second, which is, I think, very important uh, in, in relations to uh, uh, Dennis Ross, Ambassador Dennis Ross, who was the U.S. Uh, lead negotiator or head negotiator for the United States, uh, he actually threw in or attempted to throw in uh, that we have those Oslo Accords uh, that are in effect and we have a peace process and this determination and this uh, International Criminal Court investigation will actually impact and hamper uh, the peace process, as well as uh, delineating or attempting to delineate that the Palestinian Authority or the government of Palestine that does not really, was, was not given the uh, jurisdiction or a right uh, to operate under the Oslo Agreement. And in here, uh, maybe I would agree with some elements in terms of what authority was, uh, move, uh, was given and granted to the Palestinian Authority and what's not. But in general, the Palestinian Authority uh, was not a, the final determinant uh, for the rights uh, of the Palestinians as a colonized population. Uh, but again, the Oslo argument is in essence to create a almost a red herring on the investigation uh, that might uh, proceed. Uh, uh, relative to war crimes in the occupied territories. And then that the court's territorial jurisdiction comprises the occupied Palestinian territory in relations to whether the territories belong to the Palestinians or as many of these briefs uh, have put forth, uh, that the uh, Palestine or Palestinian territories are no man land, which used uh, something that I will refer to uh, uh, next, in relations to what is being argued in, in, in relations to no man land. Israel's position on the report, the Israeli uh, uh, energy minister, uh, Yuval Stenitz, uh, who has been, who has been uh, appointed by the Israeli regime to handle the international criminal uh, uh, court file, uh, disregard, disregarded the ruling as being influenced by pro-Palestinian groups such as the Global Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions Movement. So here, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Minister Yuval for actually giving recognition 
to the importance of the PDS movement. Uh, the PDS movement is based on uh, that Israel has been acting as an outlaw uh, uh, international actor, violation of the Four Geneva Convention, international law, uh, with many, many reports uh, to this end. So if there is a success of the PDS movement, uh, I would advise Yuval and Netanyahu to look no further than the mirror uh, to look at uh, what are the reasons uh, for uh, the success of the PDS movement, but also it shows that the Palestinian community and solidarity movement globally uh, have been uh, really uh, uh, working to make sure that the rights, uh, the justice, and the dignity of Palestinians is utmost uh, in this consideration. Uh, furthermore, Yuval says that prosecutors' disregard for the opinions of some of the world's leading experts on international law uh, points to her determination to harm the state of Israel and tarnish its name. So again, this is uh, tugging on uh, to say that a, a set of international law experts that Israel have put forth in the Amex brief to try to protect its right to violate the Palestinian rights uh, has to take precedent over uh, the uh, International Criminal Court, as well as uh, the Rome Statute. It says, in the, name of, in the name of this objective, he has formulated the rules of international law inventing a Palestinian state, while the Israeli-Palestinian peace process has yet to be concluded. So again, appealing to the peace process, uh, and I don't know if he hasn't noticed, uh, Netanyahu as a prime minister and before, uh, completely uh, the distance Israel from the peace process that it is dead, it is not already buried six feet under. Uh, but again, you could see the direction of the argument. Um, and uh, this is coming from the uh, Bridges for Peace, peace uh, website that reported on uh, Israel's uh, uh, position in here. And uh, again, Bridges for Peace don't be uh, taken by the name because we're still looking for actually an end of the occupation, end of colonization, ending of settlements, uh, the, the demolition of homes, uh, uh, targeted killing, unrestrained violence, sniping, snipers shooting kids uh, in Gaza, uh, and a whole host of other issues uh, that uh, Bridges for Peace uh, should be actually paying uh, far more uh, emphasis on uh, than uh, trying to uh, uh, at least distract or discount and the step that are undertaken by the International uh, Criminal Court. Now, U.S. Peace negotiator I mentioned, Dennis Ross, uh, he asserted that uh, Oslo as the framework and the court's action might impact uh, on the ongoing peace process. Again, the peace process has become the idol uh, where actually everybody's, uh, you say they're demolishing my home. Uh, well, there's a peace process they're building a new settlement, uh, there is a peace process, uh, they're taking the aquifer's water, there's a peace process, they're bombing Gaza, there's a peace process. Uh, so it became the, uh, the uh, tool by which all uh, violations of Palestinian rights are subsumed under. And unfortunately, some Palestinian, uh, uh, in terms of their uh, standing toward Israel, as well as part of uh, how to uh, counter this uh, uh, did not respond or cannot, at least did not develop the appropriate response mechanism. And I do think that our current uh, fragmentation and division inside Palestine and possibly have uh, reflection and resonance outside weaken our ability uh, to take Israel uh, to task. So if, uh, anything for us in relation to the peace process uh, is to continue to challenge this uh, uh, attempt to use the peace process as the defense mechanism and a shield to shield Israel of any criticism uh, and any legal ramification as a result of its action. And I think what we need in the following days and years uh, ahead uh, is for us to rethink our uh, political structure as Palestinians and I do, uh, uh, do believe that a government in exile uh, is one of the most important tools uh, for us to actually uh, put forth uh, as a way to simultaneously put pressure internally and externally. The other part that I wanted to mention 
uh, in the uh, submissions, there is a whole appeal uh, to this notion of Terranellus uh, concept. The Terranellus concept is a Latin expression meaning nobody's land. Uh, and you need to know and have an appreciation of this long historical link that is being put and where is this Terranellus actually emerges. Uh, it emerges out of the Catholic Church doctrine of discovery, uh, which uh, was applied to the Americas, uh, you know, as the uh, uh, discovery of America. And I put discovery between two parentheses because uh, you don't discover a place that is already inhabited and inhabited so for almost 10,000 years continuously. Uh, so as the uh, Columbus and the European settlers emerged, the Catholic Church laid claim uh, to uh, the Americas and instituted this doctrine of discovery. Uh, this doctrine of dis discovery, which included the principle of Terranellas, negated the right of the indigenous people to their own land, uh, meaning that the Native Americans, uh, uh, the indigenous population in North, South, and Central America that were living and existing as fully functioning societies, uh, for generations and uh, thousands of years uh, are really are not the uh, rightful owners of their own land. And instead, the Catholic Church, uh, through the issue of the doctrine of discovery at the time, um, shifted and granted the deeds and the rights uh, to uh, the Spanish crown uh, and then other also to, uh, to, later point, to the Portuguese. Uh, so as such, uh, this removed the right of the indigenous people to their own land. Israel advocates, or those who submitted on its behalf, are making the argument uh, that Palestine was, is nobody's land. And they have claims to it based on historical uh, connection. So on the one hand, uh, I thank uh, those who have made the link that we could actually see that uh, this long history of uh, uh, colonial discourse that negates the existence of indigenous population is being applied. But the more important in here is that because Palestine uh, came under the British rule in 1917, uh, December uh, 11, 1917, uh, therefore uh, the mandate which was supposed to uh, prepare the uh, indigenous population or the population to self-rule and then independence, uh, therefore there was no real sovereign uh, to those territories. And even the uh, Jordanian uh, governance from 48 to 67 is not seen to be uh, the rightful owner. In international law, the, uh, if a territory is occupied, uh, the sovereignty revert back to uh, the country or the uh, power that was in uh, control before uh, to the occupation uh, if ha it had sovereign claim. So the last sovereign claim uh, to Palestine belongs to the Ottomans. And therefore, since the Ottomans were uh, no longer in standing, and what we have is the state of Turkey as a successor where the uh, Ottoman state and the Turkish state relinquished their claim as a result of the Treaty of Lausanne at the conclusion of World War I, the Zionists are making the claim that this is nobody's land. Now, the way to think of it is actually, uh, is the other way, is that this is a, Palestine was a colonized land uh, that, they, that was colonized by the British uh, in 1917, and the issuing of the Belfort Declaration is an important piece relative to thinking about who has the rights to the land. The indigenous Palestinians uh, have never relinquished their claim to their land and their assertions of their political rights over uh, that land. But this is, again, uh, we need to understand where this concept of Terranellus comes and how this is being applied uh, relative to Palestine by the great international uh, legal minds. Again, you could be a great international legal mind, but vested in colonial, settler colonial epistemic. And considerable part of the international legal system, again, this is another critique, is vested in making what I call colonial legalism. Colonial legalism, which is taking the legal framing 
uh, that was uh, uh, that came as a result of a particular discourse from colonial era and making it binding uh, under the uh, auspices of international law. And therefore, moving to a decolonial international law is a very important uh, dimension. And we need to continue to assert that the uh, international legal system uh, should not uh, should be decolonized in order for us to reach a level where concepts like terra nullis that have nullified and continue to this day nullify the indigenous people's rights in the Americas, in Australia and other places, uh, including maybe in the Amazon uh, uh, forest where uh, this terra nullis is still is in its applicability. So we might think that uh, the Columbus destruction visited upon the Americas is only uh, 14, uh, 1492, but we're still living the consequences, not only in terms of the actual factual uh, consequences, but also the legal framing and umbrella that has been adopted into uh, international law. And you have some uh, great international legal minds uh, that are actually making the arguments on uh, a structure that is founded upon settler colonialism. Now, my own submission uh, to the court uh, framed, I wanted to highlight uh, not uh, an, an important aspect uh, to it, which touches in what I said. Uh, we need to have an appreciation and understanding uh, that law is born out of social, political, economic, religious conditions. And, Palest and the Palestine issue is most illustrative of this entanglement. Uh, so again, uh, you cannot approach Palestine in a vacuum. Uh, you have to take assessment of all the forces uh, that brought Palestine into uh, the current conditions that we are uh, seeing. Uh, the International Court of, uh, the International Criminal Court asked to determine whether it has territorial jurisdiction in the occupied Palestinian areas, uh, which is a question born of over a hundred years of major powers entanglement with Palestine and the destiny of its indigenous population. So before we actually begin to examine the merits of the argument, we have to actually understand there are key contexts that must be understood, which bear on how the issue should be approached and ultimately determined. Again, uh, settlers take somebody's house and that creates an, a fax on the ground uh, or a, fa a legal fact on the ground from a settler colonial enterprise or uh, setting up an outpost in a outskirt of Nablus and putting a, uh, a few settlers in there. And now, the reference of what happens that this becomes a fact that is referred to the court in any uh, civilized, uh, democratic state, if anyone steps in your home or steps on your land, you call the police. The police actually uh, takes and arrests those individuals, uh, load them up, and end up, they end up in jail because they're violating your right to the land. But if you accept the notion of this terra nullis concept and the fact that the Palestinian areas are disputed territories, Disputed by who? By the settlers who actually want to devour it, supported by the state of Israel, supported also by the United States and other Western countries because of their own uh, historical reasons. Therefore, you end up with uh, the circumstances uh, that we see ourselves today. <laughs> now, in approaching Palestine, which is again the shrinking uh, uh, map, uh, uh, that we're looking at. Uh, we have to look at the impact of prevailing uh, global events on Palestine statehood. Uh, it should not surprise us or at least comes into uh, an understanding that Israel is acting in the way that it is today uh, because it feels emboldened, it feels empowered, uh, it feels that it's uh, a regional power that everybody is looking to it uh, to create the balance of power in, in the region. And uh, as such, uh, this has to be part of the understanding of 
what are the prevailing global events, uh, including the current conflict in Syria, the destruction of Iraq, uh, the possible, uh, the on and off again, uh, confrontation with Iran. Uh, so again, those global events are very, very important and we have not yet discussed what would be the impact of the COVID-19 as uh, uh, those who have been uh, following uh, the development in uh, side uh, Palestine and as well as India, uh, that uh, these uh, uh, countries and their governments have used COVID-19 uh, to go on unabashed uh, attacks on uh, communities, Palestinians in case of Palestine, uh, Muslims in uh, India and in Kashmir. Uh, so that will be studied at a later point. So we have to take an account for uh, this aspect uh, in relations to approaching this determination. The second, uh, we need to look at the impact of racial and religious nationalism on, the pa on Palestine statehood. It's not surprising uh, that the state that have submitted an amicus brief opposing Palestine, all are being governed by extreme right-wing governments uh, that uh, are seeing or putting uh, support for Israel as one of those uh, uh, points on their agenda while they unleash uh, extreme right-wing uh, political discourse uh, domestically. And in here, it's actually uh, the Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs uh, has uh, allocated uh, close to $30 million uh, to combat the PDS movement and to uh, pursue Palestinian activism uh, across the globe. Uh, yet they will come into uh, Tel Aviv and into the Knesset, uh, some, um, some individuals that uh, their politics, uh, their uh, political party, their platform are fascist in nature. Uh, and therefore in here, the racial and religious nationalism, in essence, finds a comfort in opposing Palestine as a way of actually almost cleansing its own record and using the Palestinians uh, to do so. And therefore we need to be very clear uh, that as the court examines this, uh, that this is also uh, one of uh, the elements in there that uh, will uh, have some role to play vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the discussions of Palestinian statehood. The last is the impact of, uh, the third is the impact of millenarianism. Uh, the millenarian movements are those who again are beating the drums for the end of time and they see the uh, uh, support to Israel and support of uh, rebuilding the third temple as a, an important pillar uh, for uh, the uh, second coming. And uh, this has a very strong base of support in the United States. And as such, we have to actually make those links. It's not because they all of a sudden love uh, the Jewish uh, people or the uh, or their uh, animosity toward Muslims, they're looking at it from their own distorted, speculative, theological perspective. But that has a bearing on uh, millenarian movement and also how they affect political discourse. That the link between foreign policy and certain elements of millenarianism uh, has long standing, including the pursuit uh, from the late 19th century to the early 20th century of the reconstituting and uh, uh, bringing Zionism into Palestine, uh, some those who had some millenarian uh, tendencies and engaged in speculative theology uh, are there. And in here it's very important for us to actually speak of uh, some of the important work of uh, the Christian Palestinians. Uh, uh, Father Atik uh, in Palestine with the, uh, the work that has been done with the uh, the Kairos letter and the document that comes from the Christian Palestinians is very, very critical. The work of the uh, University in Bethlehem and the leadership in there. So again, uh, we need to be very aware and not to, uh, when we speak about uh, millenarianism within the Christian Western church, uh, not to actually begin to be uh, individuals that uh, misdiagnose the problem 
and begin to actually uh, uh, almost create animosities between Muslims, Christians inside Palestine and completely being uh, almost uh, not understanding uh, which side and which, play, which group that is uh, actually engaging in there. So again, uh, in here in the United States and other places, we have a very strong working relationship uh, with uh, uh, Christian Palestinian organizations that are been in the front, front lines and continue to develop a response to the speculative theology that attempts to, again, use a particular form of Christianity to push forth uh, this idea. As far as the substantive argument in relation to why Palestine statehood should be recognized, uh, I think anyone that has any sense of history of Palestine need to again uh, have a critique and uh, both the Balfour Declaration and the British uh, as an important and a critical piece that violated and began to negate Palestinian rights uh, to self-determination and independence. Uh, if the end of uh, World War I uh, uh, came and ushered the notion of self-determination, again, uh, I have very much uh, strong critique of how that unfolded. But in general, the, it's supposed to be that uh, the international community brought uh, the concept of self-determination and that the end of the colonial era was upon us. Uh, but simultaneously, as the uh, end of the colonial era uh, came upon us, the British uh, constituted and commissioned the last colonial possession uh, to uh, come into uh, existence, and that is Palestine. So one has to actually uh, 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 focus and understand its importance and how it functioned uh, to deny uh, Palestinian rights and Palestinian uh, statehood. The British mandate uh, was a period of incubating Zionism and incubating Israel. And the British, I would say, still owe the Palestinians a, an apology, uh, restitution, and compensation for all their uh, loss and suffering. But also, uh, they need to be in the forefront of advocating and uh, speaking for Palestinian rights and giving recognition uh, to Palestinian statehood and rights. So again, uh, this file on the British file is an important one uh, that needs uh, to be uh, challenged and continue to push. The second most important element is also to assert uh, Palestine and the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, which was adopted on September 13, 2007. Uh, the uh, Declaration of the Rights of the Indigenous People is so critical because what is uh, the rights of indigenous people, if they don't have the right to sovereignty and their own land and uh, property and territory. So Palestinians should begin in, again, uh, in terms of how we see ourselves, uh, knowing that the court is gonna have about 120 days before they issue their ruling. Whichever way the ruling comes out from the three panel judge, the judges, this should not get us to stop uh, actually uh, asserting and beginning to engage uh, other elements of uh, uh, international law. Some are problematic, the terra nullis, which I already mentioned, but some are also positive, like the Declaration of the Rights of the Indigenous People. And we have to uh, maintain and assert that the Palestinians are the indigenous people of Palestine, and they have been facing a settler colonial uh, project that continues uh, to this to dispossess them. So again, in the days and month ahead, we will see uh, what transpired. Uh, my counsel to you and to everyone is to continue to work for uh, uh, the freedom of Palestine. Palestine is free, it's a state of mind. And uh, we continue to do the needed work. Uh, I call on people to continue to adhere to the PDS movement. Uh, during the month of Ramadan, especially, uh, we call on uh, all individuals to boycott Israeli dates. Uh, there is no reason or excuse for anyone to break their fast while they're uh, chewing and uh, breaking their fast on an apartheid date, a date that is coming from a structure that is, that is practicing apartheid and violating Palestinians, and also dates that have, uh, are grown 
on stolen Palestinian uh, land. So again, the date boycott, especially in Ramadan, uh, is an important, uh, thing, is important call that uh, we have uh, to continue. So again, uh, the next steps for the ICC and Palestine, uh, ICC days, uh, 120 days, uh, and the three judge panel will issue their ruling. Uh, I will conclude with the following, which I concluded in my own uh, brief. Uh, we all inhabit the same world, and what we do on the moral and ethical front has, ramif has ramification across the globe. I do believe that the court's role is to set the tone and direction for the global community on such critical issues and allow for a uniform international legal standard to be, to be applied to all. Palestinians are the canary in the global minds of unrestrained state violence, dispossession, and upending the international legal system. In the balance sets the efficacy of the international system, and the court's decision on this matter will possibly play a role in reconstituting restraint on the use of violence by state and non-state actors across the globe. So again, the court has a very, very important role to play in here of reconstituting the restraint uh, that uh, has been uh, collapsing and deteriorating across the globe. So thank you for uh, being uh, with me on this. So I'm gonna stop sharing right now and I'm gonna check if there's any questions on uh, Facebook and we'll see what uh, happens. Uh, in relations to uh, Facebook, and I'm gonna shift to actually no background, no, and <laughs> so let's see where I'm gonna get to the questions. Okay, so let me go to Facebook and see if I could find any of your questions in here. So if you have any questions on Facebook, uh, I'm gonna take a few minutes to look at it and uh, we'll be able to answer those. Otherwise, uh, we'll stop and uh, we'll see you till next time. Okay, seeing no questions. Uh, Thank you for being with me today. And I encourage you both to read the uh, prosecutor's um, report. Uh, also, you could access uh, all the other uh, submissions, uh, MX brief. It's always good to read what your opposition writes. You don't have to agree with it, uh, but actually, uh, uh, you know, settler colonial fic uh, fiction and settler colonial uh, illogic is always good to understand. So you'd actually be able uh, to uh, respond and uh, accurately put uh, in uh, the correct framing in here. So thank you. Hopefully all of us will at one point pray in Al-Aqsa Mosque that is behind us. Uh, Assalamu alaikum.